The rocky flatlands of the New Mexico desert could feel as alien and inhospitable as the moon. On a dark night when the moon was new, this was one of the quietest places on the planet. A thousand miles of blood-red desert, its clay hills baked hard and smooth. At one o'clock in the morning on July 2nd, jack rabbits and lizards, drawn by the warmth of the pavement, were gathered on a thin strip of asphalt in a valley where a dirt road snaked its way out of the foothills and down to the main highway. The only discernible movement came from the incredible profusion of insects, a thousand species of them, that had adapted to this harsh environment. Where the dirt road ran up toward the crest of some hills, there was a wooden sign half hidden in the sagebrush. It read, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, SETI. Those who followed the road, with or without permission, to the top of the rise were rewarded with a spectacular sight. On the other side were two dozen enormous signal-collecting dishes, each one well over a hundred feet in diameter. Precision built from curved steel beams painted white, these giant bowls dominated a long, narrow valley. Because the moon was new, the only light on them was the red glow of the beacon lamps attached to the collector rods suspended over the center of each dish. The beacons were a precaution against curious or hopelessly lost pilots hitting the equipment with their planes and tangling themselves into the steel beams, like flies caught in the strands of a spider web. SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, was a government-funded, NASA-administered scientific project, and the field of giant radio telescopes was its primary laboratory. Far from the noise pollution that blanketed the cities, scientists had erected this mile-wide listening post to search for clues that would help solve a riddle almost as old as human imagination. Are we alone in the universe? The telescopes picked up the noise emitted by a billion stars, quasars, and black holes, sounds that were not only very faint, but mind-bogglingly old. Traveling at the speed of light, radio emissions from the sun reached the Earth after a delay of eight minutes, while those coming from the next nearest star take over four years. Most of the cosmic noise splashing into the dishes was several million years old, with a signal strength of less than a quadrillionth of a watt. Taken together and added up, all the radio energy ever received by Earth amounted to less energy than a single snowflake striking the ground. And yet, these giant upturned steel ears were so exquisitely sensitive they could paint detailed colored pictures of objects far too dim and distant for optical telescopes to perceive. They twisted slowly in the moonlight like a field of robotic flowers opening to the faint moonlight. Tucked between these giants was a prefab three-bedroom ranch house which had been converted into a high-technology observatory. A sky full of data was gushing down into the telescopes, zipping along fiber-optic cable into the house where it was sliced up, sorted, and analyzed by the most sophisticated signal processing station ever built. All of this technological wizardry operated under the control of a master computer monitoring the entire system which meant guys like Richard Yamoro had very little to do. Richard was an astronomer who'd make a name for himself with his work on the Red Shift phenomenon associated with quasars. Six months out of graduate school, he'd landed a position at the prestigious Università di Bologna in northern Italy. When Seti called two years later to offer him a job, he'd leapt at the chance to exchange his swank downtown apartment for a tiny cabin in the arid back country of New Mexico. Seti was founded in the early 60s by a handful of crackpot astronomers who just happened to be some of the world's top research scientists. Their idea was simple. Radio is a basic technology. It is easy to send and even simpler to receive. Its waves traveled at the speed of light, effortlessly penetrating things like planets, galaxies, and clouds of gas without significant loss of strength. If an advanced civilization were attempting to communicate with us, these scientists argued, they would never be able to cross the infinite distances of the universe. The only realistic way to establish communication with Earth would be to send a radio message. After years of lobbying in Congress, SETI won the funding for a ten-year exploration of the skies over the Northern Hemisphere. 
Under the guidance of NASA, the small staff had set up two other installations, one in Hawaii and the other in Puerto Rico. If intelligent life existed somewhere in the universe, the small band of SETI astronomers were the people most likely to find them. Richard had pulled the overnight observation shift, which in most shops would be the least attractive, but among the handful of scientists stationed in New Mexico, it was the most sought after time to work. At 4 a.m., the night watch commander could override the scanning system and use one of the large telescopes for his or her own projects, which meant Richard still had two hours to kill before he had anything interesting to do. In the meantime, he was brushing up his golfing skills. Going down to one knee, he pictured himself lining up his birdie putt on the 18th green at Pebble Beach. The entire tournament comes down to this one final shot, he whispered like a television commentator. Yamoros left himself twenty feet from the hole. Normally, that would be no problem for a golfer of his amazing skills, but he'll be putting across the roughest, most wicked section of turf, the uneven stretch of green called the walkway. That's exactly right, Bob, he murmured, becoming the second announcer. It's an almost impossible shot. The pressure is really on your morrow at this point. It's a make-or-break situation, but we've seen him come through situations like this a hundred times before. If anyone can do it, he can. At the far side of a room jammed with expensive electronic gadgetry, he laid a crinkled paper cup on its side. The golfer got to his feet and took a series of practice swings as the huge imaginary crowd looked on in perfect silence. Then he lifted his eyes to survey the scene. He glanced toward the tall, narrow machine nicknamed the Vegomatic for its ability to slice and dice the random noise of the universe into computer digestible morsels. In its place, he saw his family biting their nails as the tension mounted. His mother, a grim expression on her face, nodded her head to show her son she believed in his ability to sink the putt, thereby bringing honor and glory to the Yamoro name. The golfer looked behind him and spotted a familiar face. Carl, he said solemnly to an autographed photo of the popular astronomer Carl Sagan, mounted on the office wall. I'm going to need your help with this one, pal. At last, Yamaro stepped up to the ball, brought his club back, then, with a crisp and confident stroke, sent the ball sailing toward the hole. It moved unevenly over the worn spots in the office carpet until it reached a paper cup and clipped the edge of it before rolling off to one side. He had missed the shot. The golfer collapsed in agony to the floor. He had failed himself, his army of fans, and, worst of all, his mother. While he was down on both knees, clutching at his heart and trying to find the words which could express his feelings of sorrow, the red phone rang. The night watch commander's heart jumped into his throat. The red phone was not an outside line. It came directly from the master computer and was the signal that something unusual had been picked up on the monitors. Leaving his club on the floor, Yamaro snatched up the phone and listened carefully to the computer's digitally sampled voice reading off a string of coordinates. Blinking red lights began erupting all over the main control board. This isn't really happening, he muttered as he wrote down the time frequency and position coordinates of the disturbance onto a pad of paper. When the red phone rang, which it very rarely did, it meant the computers in the next room, the ones sorting through the billion channels of shrill, random bursts of space noise, had detected something out of the ordinary, something with an intentional pattern. With a sense of dread and a rising pulse rate, Yamaro slipped into the chair at the main instrument console and reached for the headphones. He slipped them over his ears and listened, but heard nothing unusual, only the usual hiss and crackle of the universe. Protocol at that point called for him to alert the other scientists, some of them sleeping in their cabins scattered around the grounds. But before he became a member of SETI's false alarm club, Yamaro wanted to check it out more carefully. It was probably nothing more than a new spy satellite or a lost pilot calling for help. He punched some numbers into the keyboard of the computer and took over manual control of dish number one. 
Reading the input data, the scope swiveled back to the exact position it had been in when the disturbance began. Then he heard it. Startled by the sound, he jerked backward in his chair, eyes the size of pancakes. Over the usual popping, fizzling background noise, he heard a tonal progression coming through loud and clear. The resonant sound oscillated up and down inside a frequency window known as the hydrogen band. It sounded almost like a musical instrument, an unlikely cross between a piccolo and a foghorn, and vaguely like a church organ in dire need of a tuning. It was like nothing he'd ever heard before, and he recognized it immediately as a signal. Slowly, something like a shocked smile crossed his lips, and he reached for the intercom. Ten minutes later, the small control room looked like a high-tech pajama party. Sleepy astronomers in robes and slippers crowded around the main console, taking turns with the headphones, all of them talking at once. By the time SETI's chief project scientist, Buell Ashore, came stumbling through the darkness from her cabin, her staff was already convinced they'd made contact with an alien culture. This is the real thing, Buell, Yamaro told her. Shore looked at him dubiously and plopped herself down in a chair below a poster that read, I believe in little green men, which she herself had posted. This better not be one of those damn Russian spy jobs, she grumbled as she slipped the headphones on and listened with no visible change of expression. Two things were running through her mind. This is it! we found it! There was no mistaking the slow rising and falling of the tone for anything accidental. But at the same time, her scientific training and her need to protect the project forced her to be skeptical. There was already a buzz of excitement among her co-workers, and she had seen the ruinous effects of disappointment set in after previous false alarms. Interesting, she allowed, poker-faced. But let's not jump the gun, people. I want to run a source trajectory. Doug, get on the phone to Arcebo and feed them the numbers. Arcebo was a remote coastal valley in eastern Puerto Rico, home to the largest radio telescope in the world, 1,000 meters in diameter. Within five minutes, the astronomers there had shut down their own experiments and wheeled their big dish around to the target coordinates. On a separate telephone line, high-speed modems transferred the data fed instantaneously. As the result of the Arcebo scope came over the line, the normally polite scientists jostled one another for a first look at the printout as it came spitting out of the machine. This can't be right, one scientist said, puzzled and somewhat frightened. Yamaro tore the page from the printer and turned to Beulah. According to these calculations, distance to source is 385 kilometers, he said in confusion. Then he added what everyone in the cramped room already knew. That means it's coming from the moon. Shore walked over to the room's only window, pulled back the curtain a few inches, and scrutinized the crescent moon. Looks like we might have visitors. Then, after a moment of reflection, she added, It would have been nice if they called first. Just across the Potomac River from the White House, the Pentagon was the largest office building in the world. The giant five-sided structure was home to the Byzantine bureaucracies of the United States Armed Forces and was a small city unto itself. Even two hours before sunrise, when its workforce was reduced to the few thousand souls who pulled the graveyard shift, it was a bustling place. An armada of semis were lined up near the building's loading docks to deliver everything from classified documents to restaurant supplies, while dozens of trash trucks hauled away the previous day's mountain of waste. Speeding across the southern parking lot, an unmarked late model Ford sedan was headed directly for the building at seventy miles per hour. A second before it rammed into the side of the edifice, it broke into a long skid and fishtailed perfectly into the parking space closest to the front doors. Seconds later, General William M. Gray, Commander-in-Chief of the United States Space Command and head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, came up to the steps into the lobby, the steel taps on the soles of his shoes clicking in angry rhythm across the tiled floor. Forty-five minutes earlier, he'd been dead asleep when the phone rang. Nevertheless, the stocky sixty-year-old arrived at the office looking every inch the five-star general, all spit and polish. Without breaking stride, he was joined by his staff commander, Colonel Ray Costello. 
the lanky young science officer followed his scowling boss to a fleet of elevators and opened a set of doors with a swipe of his identity card. The doors swooshed open and the two men stepped inside. The instant the doors were closed, the men knew it was safe to talk. Who else knows about this? the general demanded. Seti out in New Mexico phoned about an hour ago. They picked up a radio signal at approximately 1.15 a.m. The thing is emitting a repetitive signal, which we're trying to interpret. Costello answered nervously, trying to sound professional. He knew how little tolerance Gray had for sloppy work. They tell anybody else? The press? They agreed to keep quiet about it for the time being. They're afraid of losing credibility if they announce anything prematurely, so they're going to run additional tests. Well, what is this damn thing? Do they know? Colonel Costello shook his head and smiled. No, sir, they're clueless, even more confused than we are. Gray swiveled his head around and impaled his assistant with a disapproving grimace. The men and women who worked for the United States Space Command, an autonomous division of the Air Force, were not permitted to be confused about anything, not while Gray was running the show. Their job was to know all of the answers all of the time. Costello winced and studied the stack of papers he was carrying. Excuse me, sir. The doors opened onto a clean white basement hallway. Costello led the way down the corridor and through a thick door. He and the general stepped into a plush, cavernous underground strategy room with a big screen computerized map dominating the main wall. Designed and built in the late seventies, the room was a large oval space with the primary work area. Sixty radar consoles sunk three feet below a 360-degree parameter walkway. Three dozen high-security clearance personnel were down in the pit monitoring everything that moved through the sky. Every satellite, every reconnaissance mission, every commercial passenger flight, and every moment of every space shuttle mission. In addition, a network of specially dedicated surveillance satellites kept an eye on each of the thousands of known nuclear missile silos worldwide. With its thick carpeting and colorfully painted wall murals of spaceflight, it always reminded Gray of a goddamn library, as he had called it on more than one occasion. Take a look at these monitors, Costello said, pointing to a row of ordinary televisions tuned to news broadcasts from around the globe. Every few seconds, the picture quality would suddenly disintegrate into a rolling blur, different from any sort of picture distortion they'd seen before. Satellite reception has been impaired. All satellite reception, ours included. But we were able to get these shots. He led the way to a nearby glass table which was lit from below and showed Gray a large photographic transparency. Taken with an infrared camera, it showed a blotchy, orb-like object set against a background of stars. The image quality was too grainy and distorted for the general to make either head or tails of it. Several members of the Space Command staff joined them at the table. Gray, the only non-scientist in the group, wasn't about to start asking a bunch of asinine questions. Instead, he glowered down at the blurry image for a moment before announcing his opinion. Looks like a big turd. Costello was about to laugh when he realized his boss wasn't trying to be funny. He continued his presentation by lying down a second, equally turd-like photo of the object. We estimate this thing has a diameter of over 550 kilometers, he explained, and a mass equal to roughly one quarter of the moon's holy mother of... Gray didn't like the sound of that. What do you think it is? A meteor, maybe? The entire clique of officers glanced around at one another. Obviously, Gray hadn't been completely briefed about the nature of the object they were looking at. No, sir, one of the officers piped up. It's definitely not a meteor. How do you know? Well, for one thing, sir, it's slowing down. It's been slowing down ever since we first spotted it. Gray's trademark scowl melted temporarily into one of bewilderment as the implications of what he was being told began to register. If it was slowing down, it could only mean the object was being controlled, piloted. Without a moment of hesitation, he marched to the nearest phone and called the Secretary of Defense at home. When informed by the man's wife that he was sleeping, Gray barked into the receiver. Then wake him up! 
this is an emergency. <laughs>